Hello, and welcome to Remote Control 3, our series of creative conversations with the teams driving today's most exciting productions. Today, we're taking you behind the scenes of WandaVision with the series' amazing visual effects team leaders, Tara DeMarco and James Alexander. This is the most watched series to date for Disney+. WandaVision was so powerful, it actually crashed the system as fans flocked to see the episodes. Before we start, a big thank you to our friends at Dell, Gary Radburn and Matt Allard, and Rick Champagne at NVIDIA, and our friends at Computer Graphics World and the NAB Show. We also need to thank Michael Mansouri and the team at Meetmo, whose virtual production platform has made this series possible. Now, if you've signed up for this video series, you're already entered to win an amazing Dell Precision 5750 workstation, but more about that later. Let's get to our show and bring in our guests. They're joining us from London, where it's the afternoon. Hi, Tara. Hi, James. Hey, Buzz. Thank you for having us. Hi, Buzz. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Tara DeMarco served as visual effects supervisor for WandaVision. In her early days, she served as a compositor on Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean before working at the mill and eventually joining the Marvel team. James Alexander served as a visual effects producer on Wanda after serving as executive producer on a variety of projects at Framestore. Welcome, Tara and James. First of all, you're both in London, so thank you for making this conversation possible today. Of course. So I understand you brought some amazing clips with you and we're gonna walk through them here. So um, let's talk about the, the first um, clip we're gonna see here. This one centers around episode one. Um, uh, WandaVision stars Elizabeth Olsen as Wanda and Paul Bettany as Vision, of course. And from the beginning, Marvel promised that WandaVision would be as Marvel as anything ever made. So the bar was set pretty high at feature film levels. Can you tell us a little bit about um, that process of creating visual effects for a series uh, with that in mind? And what was that like for the visual effects team? Because this was Marvel's first streaming, nobody really knew what to expect. So we went into it knowing that we had to keep the bar high and that we needed to push the look to look as good as the features. So the characters couldn't suffer in any way, shape or form. And our main job in visual effects is actually to protect the creative and protect the characters and make sure they look like the superheroes that everybody is used to seeing. That was our really our main, main target. And then that drove every other conversation we had, be it shot count and volume or number of crew that we had to bring on to support our internal visual effects team or number of vendors we had to bring on to support that bigger vision. As you might be able to tell, it grew and grew, but Marvel supported us every step of the way to make sure we had what we needed to get our work looking as good as it did. That's fantastic. Well, so uh, our viewers who have seen the show, they know that the first episode looks very much like the the uh, Dick Van Dyke show um, and from the early days of television, shot in black and white. So we have a clip that you're going to talk us through here. Uh, can, what can you tell us about the clip that we're going to see? Well, it's interesting what you were saying, Buzz, about this being a, a, a Marvel show um, in, in the vein of all the, the Marvel blockbusters that we're, that we're used to seeing. Because of course, when the first episode aired, everybody saw that it was, um, it was very different to anything Marvel's put out before. So um, as we'll see in this first clip, um, it, it, it's an homage to uh, the golden age of American television. And the visual effects that you'll see here are much more low key than you would expect in um, perhaps a more typical Marvel blockbuster type um, visual effects show. Um, so let's play the clip and take a look. Ah, uh, Wanda in the kitchen. So some of the scenes in the kitchen had puppeteers in all kinds of crazy places with rods and wires and we cut holes in the header to fly objects through. And then other objects we needed to add later in CG to bolster the scene. You know, we could only fit so many puppeteers in at once. So we ended up making all kinds of objects. And probably the funniest thing for me is that when we were in finishing, I would look at an item and go, oh, I really don't like this. Can we take the highlight down? And it would turn out to be real. <laughs> and then the CG one would be the one I ignored and thought was fine. And it happened a couple of times. Um, when we get into the smoke effects and the fire effects, we did those, you know, as plates units with green screen elements. We tried to stay true to what you could overlay, like what could have happened on an optical printer in the time or what, you know, in Bewitched Era, they would have just hidden the wires in the walls, but they still would have used the wires. So we really, really tried to keep with 
only the effects that they could do in the era, apart from Vision, <laughs> because of his CG robot face. He is always a, a character. And part of the interesting thing about putting a man with a CG face in this scene from Dick Van Dyke is not letting him pull the viewer out of the scene. Really making sure that, that, that it stays true to how he looks and that we are noticing his kooky expressions and not the fact that he's a robot so that we can then pay attention to all of the other shenanigans like flying lobsters and, you know, pul pulverizing meat. And I think that's so fundamental to the work in this episode that nothing distracted the viewer from this being an homage to, to Dick Van Dyke in this amazing age of American sitcoms. We didn't want anybody to look at this and think there was a visual effects shot in this. I had friends in the visual effects community going, so how many sh how many visual effects shots did you have in WandaVision? Because I'm not seeing anything just yet, which of course was a, a great compliment. That's great. Well, that, that work looks amazing. And And to your point, James, I mean, I know people have a certain thing in mind when they think about Marvel visual effects, but the fact that you so seamlessly integrated this into the, the genre that you were honoring, I think is is one of the testaments to the power of what your team can do creatively, because it it's hard. It's hard to make it look like that. And uh, this is also, of course, for potentially for some generations who have seen these original TV shows and others who haven't, but they certainly have an appreciation for it. And uh, I think the work you, you folks did was incredible on that. Um, now from beginning to end, so this entire production from the minute that you got involved, Tara, to uh, to wrapping this whole thing, what was that cycle? What was that uh, production cycle for the whole team? I started in July of 2019 and we wrapped sort of early March of 2020. It's wow. a little bit longer than it was meant to be, but part of that is because of pandemic. Yeah, of course, of course. And you're making a very long feature film in a sense, right? Yeah. <laughs> With tons and tons of effects. So <laughs> now, uh, so speaking of that, and uh, this uh, clip is, I, I think, a good way to introduce it, but could you talk a little bit about the effect for Vision's head and face and how that was created and integrated? Vision has always had a CG, what we call a crown, which is funny because loads of people never realized that it was CG until they saw our assembled behind the scenes. And then I had all kinds of people calling me saying, what do you mean? That's not a prosthetic. But, it, you know, he's got these panel lines in his face and the crown really sits in his head. So even when he used to wear a prosthetic, it still had to be painted out and replaced and really, you know, integrated. The process for creating vision in black and white was a challenge because in color, his red film's very dark. And then the metal is also very dark and it just didn't look like the era and it wasn't funny and it didn't represent comedy. So what we ended up doing was testing a range of blues, like quite a few different blues with a stand-in, putting the marks on his face. So we sort of plan out where his mindstone goes and where the edges go. And then played with how much chrome we should put on the side of his head. I remember one crack was that you know, we didn't want it to look exactly like the side of a toaster, but we would play with the amount of metal up and down so that the crown would stand out, but not so much that it was distracting and certainly not blend in so that it all looked like the same texture. Yeah, I mean, as anyone who's ever shot black and white will attest, it's a different world to try and think about how color is rendered. I mean, that goes back to the classic notion of using blue lipstick on actors when they shot black and white films because it, it matched more closely the tone of what red would have looked like. So it's interesting, and I think you end up probably dealing, to your point, with the, with the sheen more on texture than you do on the actual color. And you're trying to get the sort of the, the, the sense of color, but what you're really working with is texture. So what, what you did, I think was truly remarkable. It really was very well integrated. Um, so let's take a look at the next clip. This one is from uh, episode two. This is after the series begins in black and white, of course, things change and we start to see color. So uh, to get the perfect sitcom look, these episodes were actually shot in front of live audiences with classic sitcom studio lighting, correct? Episode one was shot in front of a live studio audience. So we had an open plan set so that you could wheel the cameras from set to set and actually have the audience watch and participate. And we had actually made little previs sequences to show them kind of the gags that would happen later. So in between setups, we'd have a screen that would have 
the previs on it. And so everyone would get that, you know, there was some behind the scenes extra puppeteering happening that they maybe weren't seeing on the day. By the time, yeah. And by the time we got into episode two, we sadly did not have the luxury of time to rehearse and do live studio audience for more than one, but it was great to do the one. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems like you did need some explanation for the audience so they knew what they were looking at and reacting to, right? Because so much of this doesn't exist yet. <laughs> yeah, like the breakfast for dinner was a scene that we purposefully prevised just to show the audience what was happening so that they would understand when, you know, Wanda and Vision and the Heart sit down at dinner, it hasn't just magically changed. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. So uh, could you set up this next clip for us and tell us what we're going to see? Yes, yeah, so we're going to see the color bloom moment, as we were calling it, at the end of episode two. And this beat happens when Wanda just found out that she's pregnant and the world that she's created around herself blooms into glorious Technicolor. Um, as Tara's spoken about, the, all the filmic processes that we went through and the inspiration we took to create this effect, um, I think one of the the main goals we were looking at um and one of the things we've heard many times actually is that wandavision served as kind of a a gateway marvel production and i think being true to these cinematic processes and, and kind of the history of television um meant that it was an appealing show to a, a, maybe a wider demographic than than a lot of um than some previous marvel shows and it was really gratifying um to to hear from people that have watched the show with their their moms and their dads and their grandparents and their aunts and uncles um and it being you know a particular time um in the world um that the show could actually bring people together and as it was released episodically have it be an event on Fridays uh, that families could then get together and, and watch through and talk about um, was was you know great and and really rewarding and I do believe that you know the 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 truthfulness to the inspiration behind the visual effects uh, played it played a role in that. That's great. Well, let's take a look at the clip and have you talk us through it. The '60s didn't yet have a lot of the rotoscoping and a lot of the 70s keying that you see in Star Wars. So what we looked at were 60s films that had used like a phosphor screen for a yellow screen key. And what could have happened in the era, like keying was possible, but it was early days. So that was really our inspiration. We looked at optical processes and sort of thought about what would happen if you did a color separation pass for each of the layers of the emulsion, and then did almost like a watercolor blend and then did hand painted stars over top. So that was the thinking behind the color bloom. We did do it all digitally, but we tried to stay inspired by traditional filmmaking. It was very filmic and very cinematic and it, and it did feel like a throwback to, to the way those shows were produced. So even if it was done digitally, it was done with, with love and care, clearly. <laughs> and of course the link to the hex there with the, the hexagonal overlay. Um, which, which also went through many, many, many iterations. <laughs> and of course we see so many callbacks to that motif again and again in the show. It always amazes me how hard it is to make things look simple. <laughs> right. Very true, very true. <laughs> Yeah, but the, the the love really shows up in this scene, not not only between the characters, but also just the, the, the care that you took to create the visual effects that honored that legacy too, because it, it's hard. A lot of people have not, not necessarily seen these shows in that context necessarily. So to try and make these transitions feel genuine is, is tough. And so I, I admire the fact that you went back and really looked at how these things were done to, to influence how you did it digitally. It's beautifully done. Uh, now, uh, I understand that Matt Shackman, the director, actually began his career as a young actor in sitcoms. Did his experience in sitcoms help capture the feelings that you were creating here in these clips? Oh, I'm sure that Matt's experience lent itself to some of this. I mean, he has a great, great way with his actors and he knows where they're coming from. I mean, he knows what he wants from the scenes, but he also has a relatability with them. And I think some of that might be from having once been an actor. He certainly could speak to having been in sitcoms. You know, our stars, some of them were film stars and have never done this kind of television. So he would talk about, you know, sitcoms of the era and we would scout and he would talk about having been there as a kid for some show he had been on. Or he would engage with another actor from that era 
I think believe Steve Urkel interviewed uh, him and Paul for something, <laughs> something Marvel. But Matt uh, has a pretty well-rounded background that he brings along with him everywhere he goes. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of, of classic American television, you know, having appeared on shows like Growing Pains himself, uh, himself, excuse me. Um, and it was amazing to have his experience on the show. Um, you spoke about the attention to detail buzz um, that, that we had to apply to the, the visual effects. And there was a very, very high bar that we had to aim for because, you know, the attention to detail that Matt put into everything was incredibly meticulous. And Jack Schaefer, the showrunner and the, the writing team did the same all the way, obviously, through the, the production design and all of the departments that were just so incredibly detail oriented. Um, you know, through all the period work and everything else, um, it was it was something that we we had to do our very best to match. And I think Matt really led that from from the front for sure. And you know, I mean, collaboration is everything when you're in in filmmaking mode, right? But I think with something like this, where you're trying to honor a period and yet put your own spin on it, it really requires everybody be on the same page, from production design to hair and makeup to everybody on the crew. And I, I think it it really shows in this work. Now, now speaking of the team, could you talk a little bit about um, how many people there were on the visual effects side of things for the for the run of the show? Thousands. <laughs> um, we had twenty vendors. Um, you know, uh, all of whom uh, had, uh, you know, hundreds of artists, most of whom I would say ha had hundreds of artists. Um, you know, the credit list at the end of each WandaVision episode runs for seven minutes, I believe. And, and there was some consternation um, from the, the, the fans at home watching the credits roll, waiting for whatever tidbits might be waiting in amongst them. But, you know, it takes an absolute army to make a, a, make a show like this. Um, and so we did have a, a colossal visual effects team. Um, our vendors had a really tricky job, not just for all of the creative and, and technical challenges, but of course the the COVID situation, um, the shift and the shifting schedule, and and you know all of the challenges that that presented. So you know our vendors, uh, you know the superstars of the of the show in terms of the visual effects, and and you know they did a an amazing job. I couldn't be more appreciative of. It does take a village. And how far we've come from the days of television where they had three title cards. <laughs> we've, yes. we've come a long way. <laughs> now, at what point are you completely finished with an episode? I know that's a tricky thing because, uh, you know, sometimes it's the air date that means that you're finished. But could you describe when you know that you're finished with an episode? I, we might not I think be we're finished. Are we finished? I think we're finished. finished? I think we're finished. <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's the, the the policy of the studio is to keep going and to keep going and to keep going even when we've had to ship and when we've had to hit render in case there's an update and we can make something better for that update we will keep going until someone says stop although i must admit no one has said stop <laughs> so but it wasn't until episode 6 that we have started to push that boundary of picking up shots after the first render delivery and then maybe the second render delivery. But we will always want another version, the better version of one or two things that might bump the audience because the most important thing to us is that the audience is never removed from the story. Yeah, that's true. I mean, every visual effects artist I've ever worked with always has their list of things that they would like to improve either on their own time or on company time, but they know there's things that they want to tweak, right? And mm -hmm. uh, that list is endless. Uh, could you talk a little bit? I know it's, it depends on the number of uh, the episode itself, but the number of visual effects shots that you would have in either an episode or a series? It escalated. Um, the, the, the earlier episodes, of course, um, have a, a lower number of visual effects shots. Um, and then that really increased in, in a fairly linear way through to, to, through to the finale in episode nine. Um, we had more than 3,000 shots altogether in the, in the show. So um, certainly up there in, in terms of kind of feature level numbers of visual effects shots. Um, the first three were, were kind of around the same type of number, around 
between three and 500. And then we kind of jumped up from there. I mean, you know, once you, you show how good you can make things, then they just want more, right? So <laughs> you set up your, yourselves for this kind of thing, but that's great. I mean, it, the, the work is astounding. Uh, we do have a question here from um, one of the viewers. Uh, this is from Sean Stroh at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. He says, thank you so much for WandaVision. It was amazing and remarkable in too many ways to list. Uh, there are upfront rendering and labor costs with real-time visual effects. What do you consider the most appealing aspects of the real-time workflow? Well, the most appealing aspect of the real-time workflow is the interactive and immersive environment for the talent and the nature of getting the visual effects in camera so that, you know, all this blonde hair ends up having the right color on it surrounding you. I mean, we can composite all day long and sometimes really struggle to get something sat in a scene. If we have the wrong lighting, the light is the thing that tells the tale for us. So mm -hmm. that's what's appealing. Well, uh, let's take a look at the third clip here. And this is from the epic final episode. Could you tell us what we're gonna see? Oh, James, take it away. Yes, I can tell you what we're going to see. Um, this is, you know, this is another one of those moments that, um, where one division shook things up and you know i'm so um I, you know i'm so grateful that the studio took such a big swing with this show it being so different from um movies that have gone in the past and and so different from what people were expecting and this moment personifies that we're in the middle of our massive spectacular marvel finale and we're having a metaphysical discussion in a library <laughs> Um, you know, between two cyborgs questioning the the reality of their existence, um, synthesoids. Um, so it's uh, excuse me. Um, so it's an it's an amazing moment. Um, I think it it's um, it's an incredible visual effects moment um, with all the destruction and and these two incredible um, digital characters. Um, you know, in some parts digital. Um, and um, it's a great counterpoint to the, the 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 action of the rest of the episode. I think it's a gives you a real beat to to kind of take a breath before the the grand finale that we'll see in in just a little while. Um, but it also speaks, you know, as Tara was saying, the visual effects serve the characters. And what a great moment this is to remind you what Vision's mindset is and what we love about him as a character. And um, you know why it's so great that we're able to celebrate him and get to know him more in this series. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's what's happening in this scene. Well, let's roll the clip and uh, have you talk us through it. I love that the two visions are so different, but that the performances are both Paul Bettany. I think he did such a phenomenal job of making the vision. Um, the new vision, feel really kind of angry and evil and and has such a stern countenance. And then the, the red vision, our traditional vision that we love, seems quite soulful. And because we had this rig where we'd have Paul playing against his own double, Adam, we did it on two different days so that he could capture both parts of the performance. And so we just did everything twice. And I think while it sounded like a production scheduling nightmare, it really paid dividends in terms of what we got from the character and how he gets to interact against himself. The beat where Vision leans in to touch the Mind Stone is also pretty incredible because we get the close up on the Mind Stone, the new Mind Stone, who knows what that is? I don't even know what it is. Is it the key to the future? Who knows? <laughs> and then we got to play with, does it show a hint of the color of the original Mind Stone? Does that then go down into his eye? So that's all really fun for visual effects to get to play with these characters and what they're made of and push the story a little bit further in a you know fun and intriguing way. Um, the other interesting thing about this was the dead eye, the, 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 the vision, the white vision eye, which has this sort of inner glow to it and resolves to vision's real eye at the end to show that he's truly absorbed all of that data and has become vision.
this was all shot on our stage at Pinewood in Atlanta. So the, the whole library stage, the whole library interior um, was, was built for real um, with the action performed within. And then our lovely vendor digital domain recreated the entire thing so that we yes. could <laughs> have it in 360 and we could blow it up and we could have, you know, mindstone beams cut through columns and phase through floors, add some Especially glass smashing. Glass. Now, uh, episode nine is the conclusion of the series, and it's incredibly emotional. Um, so as we roll the clip, uh, I'd love for you to talk about some of the more challenging aspects of bringing all that emotional uh, tension together with the visual effects. So let's roll the clip and um, hear you tell us about it. All right, so here we are into the final witch battle scene. So this is the moment where um, Wanda is finally revealed as the Scarlet Witch and she gets the better of, of Agatha at, at long last. Um, this whole scene is, is testament to the amazing team at Digital Domain. Um, we, had, um, we had our actors' performances, but that's pretty much it. Everything else you see here was created by, by that team. Um, and they just did a stellar job and turned things around in, um, in, in a very, very short schedule. Um, there was a lot of work that went into the, the pace of this scene, um, into the, the look of the hex um, in the background as it's obscured by clouds. We have a lot of lighting changes that roll through this final sequence of the episode. So getting that look um, was a real challenge. Um, this moment that we're just coming up to, um, where the runes are revealed behind Wanda and she does the, the switcheroo and lets Agatha know that she's, uh, she's really kind of uh, played the trick on Agatha, that Agatha played on Wanda earlier in the episode, um, is just uh, uh, took a lot of finessing in terms of the timing and pulling all of the components together but it's obviously the the real culmination of the of the show in many ways um where we see the scarlet witch revealed for the first time um wanda's never been called the scarlet witch in the mcu before um so this is really kind of a a, a pivotal moment um and here she goes with the with the runes behind her looking totally badass um, so yeah, this was this was a moment that we that we knew had to be um, you know had to be stellar because it's it's the culmination of of Wanda's story in a, in a lot of ways. Um, again, the, one of the things I love about the show is these amazing action beats are then juxtaposed with very emotional moments um, that we get in in the scenes that follow this with the with the goodbye um, as Wanda shuts everything down. But yeah, this was an incredible scene because it was um, it was built so much from scratch, um, and the the team at DD, as I say, just had such a pivotal role in making it look as as powerful and uh, and as cool as it does. Matt also really wanted the audience and everyone to feel like Wanda had given up, and that she just couldn't take it anymore, and she was so inconsolable that she had to give Agatha her power and then have the flip to this super power reveal was a huge emotional moment for Matt and for us to make sure that that translated to the audience that it seemed like it was the end and then we would sort of flip it on its head and have this superhero <laughs> unbelievable glorific final shot of Wanda in the costume that every fan has been waiting for forever and ever and ever. <laughs> so he, he had that crescendo in his mind the whole time and really helped us see that vision and made sure that this was as lyrical was a word he used often. He wanted uh, some of these scenes to be really lyrical and to take their time and to sing when they were finished. The emotion in the final scenes of WandaVision were actually a North Star for us and that we knew that we couldn't be distracting to Wanda's story, which is about her grief and about her family. And so all of our visual effects had to support that story. If we made any moment too big or too convoluted, 
then suddenly we weren't paying attention to Wanda. We were paying attention to the visual effects and it just didn't work. So it ended up being a thing that helped guide us to make sure that the scenes were as dramatic as possible and just supported. And to that point, um, we knew that we had to create an effect in the goodbye moment when um, when Vision leaves Wanda in, in the final um, episode of the series um, that was beautiful. And the team at ILM did a, did a phenomenal job of bringing that together, um, but that wasn't distracting and didn't detract in any way from the, the amazing, powerful beat that the, that the writers and, and Matt had put together. Um, one interesting point about that scene is that as we were building vision and, and you know, we have done the whole show of, of creating vision in different ages and different environments and different scenarios. Um, really, when we had the whole world disintegrating around him and this choreography of this kind of ultimate crescendo of, of grief, grief and pathos, we made sure that we kept Paul's eyes because as we rotate around vision, and you can see him looking into Wanda's eyes. It's Paul's performance that's really there that sells it and underlines um, all of the power in, in that moment. So that was an incredible example of um, how Paul's performance really sold everything that we built around it. The majority of our final episode was, was shot in additional photography. Um, we had a hiatus between coming from Atlanta and then the pandemic hit and we went on hold like everybody did until we picked up additional photography some months later than we had originally intended. Um, that gave us the opportunity to, to get started with an awful lot of visual effects we wouldn't necessarily have been able to otherwise and push everything forward. Um, one of the amazing things about working for Marvel is that there is a culture of pushing for excellence and pushing everything to be as possibly as good as it can possibly be. If things can be 1%, half a percent, any increment better, um, then, then things will be pushed um, to, to be as good as they possibly can, you know, for the characters, for the fans, um, and for the, you know, the, the filmmaking overall. So that having that time really allowed us to, to push everything up um and and make it as good as we possibly could in in the time that we had with that in mind the time that we had wasn't as much as we would have liked which i think is every visual effects person's story and mm -hmm. that we filmed the last episode last which was great in one way but it meant that we didn't have a ton of time to work on the witch battle and to do all of the rest of the visual effects that happen in that final episode. So we tried to be strategic and to give certain vendors certain sequences, just so we were multitasking and really trying to work broad rather than pile any amount of work onto any one vendor. Unfortunately, we just still had a ton of work. So our vendors were really truly heroes in that final episode. I think that they carried an enormous burden of telling such a big tale in such a short time and succeeded with flying colors. Really, really gave everything, all of their time and all of their family's time so that we could have this finale for this series that meant so much to so many people. Well, absolutely hit the mark on all of the above. Uh, it was a truly epic finale to a, an epic series. And uh, I think it was groundbreaking. I think what you've done uh, has really raised the bar for everything that's happening in streaming and in television. So thank you both for this incredible contribution. Uh, I did want to point out that uh, David Bedencourt of the Washington Post raved in his review when he said, the honeymoon is far from over for Wanda and Vision and Marvel Studios. Anyway, your work has kept us all at the edge of our seats for all nine episodes, so congratulations to you and to Matt Shackman and the entire Marvel team for your incredible work. Thank you, James Alexander and Tara DeMarco for joining us here today. Thank you, Buzz. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Buzz. I have a million more questions. They'll have to wait till next time. So thank you. And um, everybody, please be sure to join us for the next episode of Remote Control 3 when we take you behind the scenes of Marvel's newest hit, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And remember, we'll be drawing for the Dell Precision 5750 workstation during the series. If you're already registered for our conference, then you're already registered to win. And with that, I want to give a big thank you to our friends at Dell, Gary Radburn and Matt Allard, 
Rick Champagne from NVIDIA, and the teams at Computer Graphics World and the NAB Show. Thank you again to Michael Mansouri and Johan Romero for providing us with their incredible Meatmo virtual production platform to produce the series. And thank you all for joining us and our producers, Brett Harrison and Mike Piltzecker and our friends at Disney and Marvel Studios. Look forward to seeing you next time.